Hi, this is Dean Brown, and you're watching the Guitar Mania Channel. Welcome to Vienna. Well, I'm very happy to be back here again. Mm, I understand it's not the first time that you... No, no, no. I've, I've been here many, many times. I think I've played here uh, um, with my own group at least four or five times, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, not, not at uh, Reigen, though. Um, I did a trio here once. Right. Um, actually a quartet, but it turned into a trio because, oh, it's an interesting story because the bassist uh, uh, had an in incredible back spasm problem and couldn't play the gig, so we played just two guitars and drums that night. But, but generally I had played uh, before I was playing uh, at Porgy and Bess. I saw that Snowy White uh, came to one of your concerts. He did, the last show. It was so exciting to, to actually meet somebody from Floyd, you know what I mean? It was really great. And he, um, uh, from what I'm told, he generally doesn't stay and watch the shows that much, but he stayed the whole night and I got a CD too. <laughs> So I was, uh, I was like, hey, hey, wow, that's, awesome. that's incredible, awesome. yeah, you know, um, he's such a, an important part of, you know, of, uh, of rock history, you know, and, uh, and hopefully rock future, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know. Did, 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 did Pink Floyd or Thin Lizzy pl play a role in, in influencing you? In well, I, I think it's hard to, for, for you to uh, be a musician and not be somehow um, influenced by Pink Floyd somehow, mm. you know what I mean? Because their music was so, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uniqueness of their uh, approach was so compelling. I think that a lot of people tried to, oh, I'm going to write like a, try to write like a Pink Floyd kind of song, you know, or something like that. Or, but then also about the guitar sounds and things like that, I think those are, uh, you know, things that maybe if I didn't directly um, uh, identify with them, certainly hmm. somehow they they're they're a, a part of the fabric of 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 of, of certainly of, of of jazz fusion in a way. Hmm. You know, hmm. being in Vienna, I mean, uh, birthplace of Joe Zawinul, and you played with Joe and his Did 2002 that. record. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, faces and places. Faces yeah. and places. Mm -hmm. What? What do you remember from Joe? How was how was working with him? Uh, it, w it was fantastic. For you know, he's um, you know Joe is is as you know as you all know here, he's probably one of the greatest uh, musicians to ever live, and uh, and his approach to writing and uh, to producing is very organic. It's not like what you would think of a of a um, from a genius who, who, who was still playing, actively playing classical piano and stuff, you know what I mean? And uh, it's very just, man, I want you to play what you hear, you know, and, uh, and just make the music come alive. And, and, there's a, and uh, he really didn't tell me very much to do because he said, uh, you know, I, I called you because I want you to do what you do on my music, you know, and it was so great. And we've talked more about boxing than we talked about music. You're kidding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, he, well, you know, he's a huge, I mean, you, as you probably know, he a, was a huge boxing fan mm. and knew a lot. He even worked a corner for a couple of fights. I don't know if you were aware of that. No, no he was really into boxing, you know what I mean? And, uh, Miles Davis brought him to a Muhammad Ali fight, you know, and stuff, and some famous stories about that. And uh, so, uh, but Joe is, you know, and then you know, of course, everything that he did with Cannonball, and then of of course, Weather Report. It, it, these are these are the, uh, you know, this is the architecture of our of our modern music. Mm. You know, he's one of the architects. Yeah. You know, so. Talking about architecture of modern music, I mean, you also toured with Billy Copham this year uh, for the fourth anniversary of Spectrum. I mean, mm -hmm. wow, what a record! I mean, yeah, and we're still and we're playing those tunes, and those tunes hold up just as much today as they did 
you know, uh, 40 years ago. And, and Billy's rearranged them slightly, you know, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, just to give them a little bit new, a new life, you know, but they're still fantastic. We're playing the, you know, the beautiful tune, not only from Spectrum, we play some tunes from, uh, from uh, Crosswinds as well. Yeah. And, and one tune in particular, uh, it was, which I think is one of the most beautiful songs that's ever been written, is a tune called Heather. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, is just an amazing ballad, you know, and uh, um, so we're playing that, you know, so, you know, even though we're playing everything from the, uh, from the Spectrum record, almost all the tunes from the record, um, we're also, like I said, playing a couple of things, and of course we're doing some new things, and he's uh, been very generous with us in terms of, uh, he wants each person in the band to contribute material mm. as well. Mm -hmm. So he's playing a song from my, from me, and a song from Rick Fierro Bracci, and uh, and uh, and one from uh, Gary Husband as well. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's really hard to think of, of 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 any musician that you haven't played with. I mean, oh, there's a number. You know what I mean? But uh, but uh, you're right. I've I have had a I have had a very uh, um, rich and and uh, colorful and fortunate um, um, experience. It, who, I mean, who of, of the people that you haven't played with, is there anyone that you would like to cooperate in the future? Is well, in the, yeah, no, there's a couple people that I that passed away that I don't get, a, that one, mm. I'm not going to get a chance to like. Miles Davis is, you know, one for sure, you know. Um, you know, I think um, always there's, the, I've, I've, you know, even though I've done a couple of gigs with Herbie Hancock, um, you know, I would like to do more. Mm. You know, he's, he's such a... I would just like to experience more of that. Everybody you play with, it, people when they, when people talk about who your biggest influences are, you know, it's easy to say, oh well, it was Jimi Hendrix and Wes Montgomery, but I never met those guys. Hmm. You know what I mean? Um, or, or you know what I'm saying? Those that that type of thing. Um, the real fact of the matter for me is um, um, the people that I'm most influenced by are the people that I've played with because those are the ones that can actually you know real time interact with me mm -hmm. and tell me hey that you know mm -hmm. do that's don't do that or do that or or just even talk about other things you know just there's influence in music is uh is you know when you get to uh, uh, a certain um uh understanding of how music works you don't need to talk about the actual theory of music anymore. You can just talk about life, mm. and 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 you and just listen to what the person's playing, and what they're or what they're not playing, or what they are trying to pull from you. And that type of experience is what really influences you, you know? Mm. Not so much, you know, someone told me don't don't play G on this chord or something like that. That that's 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 uh those influences occurred too. But I'm just saying as you get you know so as you get to a certain level yeah. of understanding, it's music becomes really your life, not not mm. just the notes. So it's very much listening to what other people play actually. I mean uh, Yeah much more, if I understand you correctly. But, what, but listening to what somebody plays in reaction to what you played, mm. or vice versa. Those types of things create an influence, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and presumably your ear is your, your, your guiding uh, uh, principle or, or guiding... Uh, yeah, uh, for me, I mean, the ear, you know, uh, I, I don't play guitar with my fingers, you know mm. what I mean? I play it with my with my ears and, and with my heart and, and uh, you know, I always tell students, you know, I say, look, you know, it's here and it comes through here and then it goes out to your hands. Mm. So your hands could play piano, your hands could play trombone or, 
accordion or guitar. It doesn't matter. You uh, know? Mm, I have two questions for you in this, in this respect, and okay. I, I'm really looking forward to your answer, what you're saying to this. This one is uh, uh, the, the, the instrument, uh, like a piano, is co totally structured different, the way it's, the, it's, it's layout from a guitar, for instance. I mean, you see all the notes there, and it's, uh, you, you, in a way you see it in the guitar too, but uh, do you think that this um, has a, a big influence on the way you play? What? The, the well, the, the, the way the guitar is laid out with the strings. Yeah, well, here's what's interesting, is that, is that if you just look at the guitar as, you know, a string that's pulled taut between two points, mm. right? And there's a bunch of them on there, right? And you think of it like that, that's a completely f liberating feeling, you know, as opposed to a piano where, you know, you hit the notes C is C every time, you know, here, but on a guitar, you can bend it, you can do, you know, you're touching the actual thing that makes the sound, you know, so there's so much you can do in that regard, you know, with, uh, with, the, new, with, with the nuance of how you approach uh, playing the guitar. So I think um, most guitar players, um, well, certainly guitar players, modern guitar players, uh, you know, this is less true probably of pure jazz guitar players. Um, when I say, you know, I'm talking about guys that are playing, a, you know, heavy strings and uh, um, don't really bend, we can't, we can't bend the string because it doesn't bend. So they get, um, they have a slightly m more limited palate because of that. But the guys that are younger that, are, uh, you know, have, you know, uh, you know, whammy bars and, and, uh, and guitars that are designed to, to really uh, be like rubber bands, you know what I mean? Um, that, you, there's a whole other element. Of course, distortion and everything it creates another element um, to creating sound that's completely different than, mm. than piano. Mm. Having said that, when you listen to someone like Joe Pass, or you listen to, uh, um, um, there's a, um, a friend of mine that teaches at MI, um, I don't know why I can't think, uh, Sid Jacobs. Mm -hmm. He approaches the guitar like trying to play voicings like a piano player. I mean, as well as a guitar player, but like a piano player. Mm -hmm. And so in other words, he's trying to find ways to add open strings so that he can get closer voicings. You know, obviously big voicings, wide voicings, uh, fourths, fifths, you know, big triadic things are easy to play on the guitar because the bigger the voicing, it looks like this when you play it, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? But the smaller the voicing, like the more clusters, all of a sudden your hand turns into like Alan Holsworth. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, have you ever been tempted or, or to, to, to use like a, a seven string, eight string guitar thing? I mean... Not so much. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to figure the six string out, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, uh, and I'm comfortable with it. I think... Um, uh, the thing that bothers me about the seven string when I play it is I have a hard time playing um, rhythm guitar on it. Hmm. It seems like a good vehicle for for soloing because it you know you can it's got this huge range. But I think and maybe it's good for solo guitar like where you want to add bass notes, lower bass notes, and things like that. But when you're want to play like funk rhythm or mm. just you know just chunk away playing uh, on on jazz like um, like on a you know 4-4 four, four, you know um, it, it's like you're you're having mm. to mute so much that you it's not fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, you know, no, I, you I, know. I, I was just curious because yeah. I mean, so whether you f felt at some stage uh, of your playing that you that the six string limited you in your approach. No, to not at all. I mean, like the six. Believe me, I'm. I'm. There's so much further for me to go with that. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm. You know, I don't consider myself a really uh, um, great guitar player. I'm. A, I, I consider myself a. a a really good storyteller, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and like I said, I use the guitar to 
I use my ears, you know, and the guitar just happens to be the instrument that I chose. You also developed a, 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 an application, uh, the um, uh, yeah, pickup pick tunes. tunes. Um, can you talk a bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I truly am uh, concerned with guys learning um, the guitar the wrong way. In other words, like just learning licks and putting all the licks together and and not really, you know, playing the lick where it belongs. They just play it because their hand knows how to play it. And uh, and I I uh, there's a euphoric feeling that you get when you play the note that you really wanted to play, you know? And when that happens, it fills your soul with, with positive energy, you know? And so if you work on your ears more than you work on your guitar, because usually most guys' ears are lower than their guitar technique, you know? then now all of a sudden you don't need to know the names of the notes or chords or any of this stuff you just play what you hear you know mm -hmm. and if you have really if you've really worked hard on your ear training you'll hear things that are that are not on you know just the normal simple you know uh harmonic progressions you'll hear more um creative uses for harmony and mm. things, and all of a sudden you'll find out that harmony is not this vertical thing. Like, oh, this is C major, and now this is G7. Harmony is moving like this. It's moving, you know, mm. not vertically, but horizontally, just like the rest of the music. Mm. You know, a, a chord for me is just a snapshot of an event that's happening in real time, mm. you know? Yeah, no, I see what you're and saying. So, Pickup tunes is is my way of introducing younger musicians um, to the idea of of speaking the language of music. You know, mm. which and that language is to be able to hear it. In other words, if I play G7 uh, sharp 11 with a 13 on it, right, mm -hmm. and I play that chord. If your ear is good enough, you hear that like a note. You don't hear it like a chord. Mm. You hear it just a boom. Mm. And all the, it, it looks like that. So if I'm looking at that painting, it's right like there, a color, isn't it? I, exactly, or no, more than one color. It's like looking at a at a. If I look at that, if mm. I'm looking at you, mm. right? I'm not looking at your nose and then your eyes and then your lips and then your. I'm looking at you to recognize your face. Bang. Mm. It's like a chord. Mm. See what I'm saying? Mm. You know. Is there, I mean, in addition to your to your to the app that you developed, uh, any 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 particular tips or recommendations that you would have for young musicians uh, in in uh, how they can develop their hearing? Yeah, I mean, you know, the biggest thing you can do is to work on it. That's all. You know, the thing is, is there's no shortcut. It's like learning how to read. You want to learn how to read music? Just start reading, mm. and read a lot, and read a lot. Maybe I need to do that. But, but uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> but, um, but my point is that, that um, I always tell, tell students, look, it's like, it's like, it's like uh, training. Like if you were training like to you know, go to the gym and, uh, um, and you try to do one push-up. And you know, if you're weak, you can only maybe do one. You know, mm. And then you can't do two. And then after about three days of trying, maybe you, you can do two. You know, mm. and then after, you know, a, a month, you know, wow, you can maybe do 20, you know, mm. and after six weeks, now you can do 50, you know, and so on and so forth. The next thing you know, you can do 100, mm. right? It's the same thing with ear training. And there's no, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, of different ways to try to train your ear. One thing is uh, just listen to the radio. Try to listen and figure out what it is. I mean, that's what we're all doing anyway, right? Or if you like a song, and if you're gonna, you know, I'll tell you another thing that I, that I recommend. Just pick a solo, guitar solo, or not a guitar solo, whatever that you like. 
figure out what key it is, right? Because <clears throat> if, you know, if you have perfect pitch, it doesn't matter. But if you don't, figure out what key it is, and then put the guitar or the piano down, and just work on it, and try to figure out what the solo is without using, you know, not, now, I don't recommend doing that if you're trying to figure out a song for a gig. Do however you have to, you know what I mean? You want to know, learn it as quick as you can, you know? But I'm talking about as an exercise. Just start transcribing without the instrument. Mm -hmm. That'll help a lot. Mm -hmm. I meant to ask you, I mean, uh, you, 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 you're, you're such a great teacher. Um, do you think that uh, becoming a teacher helped you also in your development as an artist and as a musician? Without a doubt. There's, there, there can be no doubt. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's crystallized everything that I believe about, about, uh, about music, you know, and, it's, and I'm constantly learning new things because uh, I have to kind of try to stay ahead of well, so would So would you basically say also teaching, not only learning, but also teaching other, other, other people uh, is an important uh, process of you becoming a, um, a sort of a well-rounded uh, musician? It can be, if, you're, if you do it in the right way, you know. It can also be a, a, a dead-end rut, you mm -hmm. know, if you do it the wrong way, you mm -hmm. know, where you feel like, this is my life now, you know, and now I'm just going to go here and, you know, and, um, and clock in, you know, and put in my eight hours, you know, and then go home. Um, sometimes uh, um, career educators, uh, can lose their passion, you know, but the really good ones never do, mm. you know, so that's Dean, not a problem. Dean, let us talk about your, your, your latest record, Unfinished okay. Business. Um, um, why the title? Well, the, we did a lot of tunes that uh, were tunes that I had laying around for a long time that, that we, not laying around, we actually were playing this music, but I never recorded it. And, um, you know, when you make a record, like uh, I made my first record, I had an extra f four tunes that I wanted on the record, but the CD can only, can only handle what it can handle, right? And then I made the next record, and I had two or three tunes. You, you see what I'm saying? And so it goes on, and, th and then after, af and then I had a bunch of music before that, because it took me 25 years to get anybody to sign me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. So, so uh, there were a, a, a few choice tunes that I thought were important to, uh, to get on there. And then we had some music, you know, that, uh, that uh, Marvin Smitty Smith wrote and some other stuff that I wrote that, uh, that uh, we had been playing and hadn't recorded yet and we just wanted to, um, we weren't even thinking about making a record initially. Mm. Initially, it was just, let's make sure we just document. I'm glad you made it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. Me too. Yeah, I think it came out great. You know, yeah, so, uh, um, and what I love about it is, is that we went in the studio and played the music. We, knew, we already knew the music. It wasn't like, you know, I hate making records. Um, I hate having to make records. I love making records anyway, you know what I mean? But I hate having to make a record where you go in the studio and you play the material without having ever played it live. So you never gave it a chance to sort of flower and grow. Well, we didn't, we didn't do that. All the music that we played on that record mm. was music that, that we had played you know, on gigs. So we were, when we went in, that we, it was just like playing a gig. Hey, let's play this song. Mm. Not what chord goes here, and you know, should we change this? And then mm. and we didn't have to do that. Right, you know, we right. just had to go in and. How long did it take you to record uh, the business? Well, in actual real recording time, probably only a couple of days. But mm. it, those couple of days were spread out over like a year and a half. Wow. And well, like I said, we weren't. You got to remember, we weren't. We weren't. Um, necessarily trying to make a record. We were just trying to, right. you know make sure we, that if the, everything worked right, we'd have ma the material, you yeah, know. Yeah. So. I, I'm, I'm so glad you made the record. It is a great record, really. Congratulations on Unfinished Business. Uh, you also said in an interview that you perhaps for your next project, and not, I don't know whether this is still true, you're writing ensemble stuff? Yeah, I wanted, um, uh, I don't know if it'll be the next project, but it's, 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 it's a big, uh, um, I've already started writing some big band charts, and I want to. Uh, uh, 
I want to try to do a large ensemble mm -hmm. record. Uh, you know, um, it's very terrifying for me, but it, it's also, and the same thing goes with a solo record. You know, I, I, I really want to make a, a solo guitar record. That's not my forte, but I, I, but I do play a little bit of solo guitar usually on the gig, you know, and, uh, and I love the way that sounds. And I, I could probably be pretty good at it if I did it more. <laughs> so that's why I, uh, I want to actually uh, force myself mm. to make a record like that so that maybe I can uh, uh, improve that area. Mm. You know? if you, last question. If you were to give one piece of advice to a young aspiring musician who wants to make it music uh, his or her profession, what would that be? Um, don't think about making money. Mm. Don't think about you know, what other th people think about you or anything. Don't think about any of that. Just think about practicing and getting better. And, and focusing on the music because if you're good then when someone approaches you and they hear you play you'll be ready whereas if you just think about the uh, you know the uh, let me put it a different way if you work at uh, McDonald's you know is right okay so you have you You work there for eight hours a day, right? You hate it, right? Because you're just making burgers all day. It's smelling french fries and burgers all day, right? Then you go home and you're done, right? You have to be willing to do that as a, as a musician. You have to be willing to put in eight hours a day to work on your music. Mm. It's your job. So it can't be like, well, I'm not gigging, so I'm not working. That's ridiculous. Mm. It just makes no sense. Mm. It's, it's uh, disrespectful <laughs> to the rest of the musicians that, that work hard. So all I'm saying is just focus, work hard. Mm. And that's my, uh, that's my advice to young musicians. Dean, thank you so much for, for this opportunity yeah, and for talking you. to you. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. And I look forward to, uh, to seeing more of uh, your stuff so I can look at it to other guys. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.